It's been 18 years since my mom died and my birth mom, Val, found me through her obituary. In those first long days of mourning, I didn't want, it was too hard to be close to Val and I needed to keep my distance. But over the years, I found it better to draw her near. Sometimes it's still hard to know just how close to be. Like last fall, when my husband and I mapped out our trip to take our daughter to college, having Val's house smack dad in the middle of that 22 hour trip started turning into this huge complication. My husband, Mr. Business, pointed out we had business to take care of, a young lady to drop off and send on her way. Val would want a visit. We didn't have time to stop. But how could we not stop? What would that mean for our relationship? What I needed to do was focus on my daughter and that relationship first. And then on the way back, then we could stop at Val's. So this is a story of letting go. This is a story of being gathered up again. We start with the letting go, the hardest part. This part takes place in Southern Virginia at the College of William and Mary, where we unpacked a minivan and carried a year's worth of possessions up the steps of a 100-year-old building and down a long hall into a room taller than it was wide. Air conditioning in Virginia? Did I mention this was a 100-year-old building? After the day of moving in, stretching extra long peak pink sheets onto a lofted bed and driving around to find a target that still carried the right-sized window fan, we spent the night in Williamsburg for the welcome celebration. We gathered along with thousands of others on the lawn of the Palace Gardens to watch the fireworks. It was momentous and it was beautiful and it was without our daughter. She was there somewhere near us, at least according to find my friend on my iPhone. <laughs> but we never did find her. The Fife and Drum Corps started up and we followed them and the torches the whole way down the Duke of Gloucester Street, not willing to fall behind because we could not stand the thought of not seeing her on this part of the journey, but we never saw her there either. We staked ourselves by the historical home of the college president, not willing to give up any ground when they said, parents, step back, step back. <laughs> We watched the freshmen advance, flags of their dorms waving, Monroe Hall, Hunt Row, that's her, that's her. We strained to see her, to listen to, for her voice as the students serenaded the president, but we never did hear her. She has my voice, unfortunately, so we really should have been able to hear her. <laughs> we hurried back to her dorm and hovered in the shadows near the steps, and there we saw her striding across the lawn, three abreast. Under an arc of campus light, we saw she was okay, already with friends. That's her. We whispered to each other, that's her. She came to us, already changed, eyes bright as the middle August moon, smile quick. All what I'd hope for, hope for her. It was here we said our goodbyes. We went back to our hotel with a hole in our family. The next morning, we resolved to attend the rest of the parent orientation sessions. We pulled out our maps and opened umbrellas and began our walk. In planning out the trip, we thought we'd have this part of the day with her too, and we didn't. It was a long walk to the conference center. We walked a mile and my husband said, it's still farther. The light rain turned spiteful. My pants soaked to the knee, it's still farther. We crossed against the light and set our jaws. We were Midwesterners, we could do this. <laughs> the little spite in the rain turned into a campus crusade and a deluge. We ducked under the awning of the Days Inn. My iPhone said we'd walk two miles out of our way. My husband wanted a cab, but by the time it would come, the session would already be over. We could just walk back to it. On the way back, there were rivers to forge, but I'm told I speak in hyperbole. I was wet to my hips now, and that was not a hyperbole. <laughs> we got all the way back to where my phone said we should be, and I realized I'd plugged in the general campus address. <laughs> We'd actually been on the right track before, back by the days in. We changed plans and trudged back to the hotel. We dried off, changed clothes and checked out, and drove to the session. It turned out we didn't need it. 
It was for parents who couldn't let go and we'd walked clear past any such needs. <laughs> we drove off campus without saying another goodbye. I sent a text and turned off my Find My Friend app for my daughter. I knew what I needed to know. She was there and I was somewhere else on a Virginia highway, stuck in traffic. This was the time for gathering ourselves together. 10 hours later, we made it to my birth mother's place. Val brought us into her home and we told her what happened. The parade, the serenade, the goodbye, the rain. She took our wet clothes and carried them down to her cellar. She put them through the wash. We just wanted something simple for dinner, I told her from the road. She gave us a candlelight dinner, dessert, another glass of wine, a hug before bed. Afterwards, I went down to check on the wash, but she'd already moved everything to the dryer. In the morning, the clothes were folded by our bedroom door. I don't have any idea what it's like to leave your baby with strangers, but I do know now what it is to leave your daughter behind. What these currents of life bring, what they take away, it's changing, constantly changing. All we can do is keep crossing the bridge to reach others. Sometimes the weight of what we carry across can overwhelm us. Sometimes we're too fearful what's below or too worried about our footing to see what's on the other side. I never had to forge across what Val did, but last fall I came as close as I've ever been to walking her path. And all I had was this, rain, soaked pants, and traffic. And on the other side, still the chance to be mothered. A blessing paid back and paid forward. Simple food, a hug before bed, folded clothes in the morning.